And it's dead in my transgressions, wandering in sin. I went searching for redemption down a road that had no end. I was walking through the fire. I was living on the run with my flesh lost in desire. I was drowning in the flood, but God, rich in mercy, you came to save me. Now I'm alive, but God, strong and mighty, you reached out for me, so I. Far from being perfect, there are days that I regret. On this battlefield, I struggle with the lies that I have lived. I have fallen short of glory. I can't make it on my own. If you counted on my past, I'd be sinking like a stone. But God, reaching. You came to save me, now I'm alive, but God, strong and mighty, you reached down for me, so I could rise, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out, I was in the grave. But God, you called me out. Now I'm breathing in. I'm breathing out. I was in the grave. But God, you called me out. But God, rich in mercy, you came to save me. And now I'm alive. My God, strong and mighty, you reached out for me so I could rise. But God, rich in mercy, you came to save me. Now I'm alive. But God, The cross has 
There's nothing stronger, nothing higher, nothing greater than the name of Jesus. All the honor, all the power, and all the glory to the name of Jesus. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. The Savior has come with the morning light. The cross has the final word. Not to us, but to you. All glory and honor is yours. No, not to us, but to you. All glory and honor is yours, is yours. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. He trained. Death for eternal life. The cross has the final word. Oh, yes, the cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. The Savior has come with the morning light. The cross has The cross has the final word. Yes, the cross has the final word for us. Isn't it wonderful to know that we're complete in Christ, made mature in Him, our sufficiency is found in him. Oh, let's rejoice that Jesus is the answer.
As we are all aware that this past week uh, there was some weather in the area and so uh, some people made out well but several people had very difficult times and I just want to uh, let you know that uh, 
what were, what, if you want to help these victims, especially on the North Shore in Slidell where the tornado was, uh, Don at what was Zephyr Field on Airline Highway tomorrow from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, you can drop anything off there that you feel that would be needed. There are dry goods and canned food and tools and anything that you wanted to do, you would be able to do it there. And so would you join me in prayer, please? Father, we come together and we praise you and we thank you. We thank you for the blessings that we have received. Some of them come to all of us. Some of them come to each of us. Father, we realize that if we live on this planet with the curse that is upon it, there are moments from the planet's point of view that we end up in pain and suffering. We lift up those people this past week, either in the flooding on the South Shore or the storms on the North Shore. We lift them up to you. Some people are just now trying to put their lives together. There are people that have no power or no water yet. And thank you for all those who have responded to them and come to their aid. But Father, we know that there's never too much aid in a situation like this. And as a culture, our memory is usually short, that we remember it intensely for a short time and then we forget all about it. But may we continue to help these people who have such great need. Father, as we come to your word this morning, we pray that it would educate us. We pray, Father, that it would motivate us. And we pray that it would convict us of your truth as we desire to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Injustice. The absence of justice. The violation of the rights of of others. And every day since the fall of man, injustice has occurred somewhere in the world. I'm sure it's occurred in every life, including yours. But the single greatest act of injustice occurred around 2,000 years ago. And the recipient of that injustice was Jesus Christ. First, there were three illegal trials. One before Annas, one before Caiaphas, and the other before the Sanhedrin. They were illegal because Jewish trials are not allowed to occur at night. All three did. And then he was taken to Pilate. And Pilate saw the injustice of the accusations against Jesus Christ, and he tried his best to deal with it. Open your Bibles to John 18. I want you to see four things that Pilate did here, trying his best to not condemn Jesus Christ. John 18 and verse 28. It says, and they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium. It was early. And they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. The Jews aren't allowed in the Gentile praetorium. It made them unclean. I'm sure that aggravated Pilate. You're going to make an accusation here, and you won't even come in and stand before the person. Therefore, Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered, and they said to him, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. Now, was that an answer to the question? You know, the fact that we brought him here should be enough. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves. 
and judge him according to your law. I don't want anything to do with this. You take him, you judge him. And the Jews said, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. Wow. So he tried to get rid of it, but they couldn't. Go with me now to Luke 23 and verse 4. Luke 23 and verse 4. Here we see Pilate, and Pilate said to the chief priest and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept insisting, saying, he stirs up the people teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. And when Pilate heard it, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he had belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was in Jerusalem at the time. This is really a good human interest. Pilate and Herod, up to this day, hate each other. And Pilate said, wait a minute, he's a Galilean, not my jurisdiction. Send this guy to Herod. Let Herod deal with him. That was the second time. Then if you look also over at verse 14, verse 14 of Luke 23, it said, Pilate summoned, 13 says, Pilate summoned the chief priests and rulers and the people. And he said to them, you brought this man to me as one who incites people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you've made against him. Same, same exact answer. I got nothing. There's nothing here. No, nor is Herod. For he sent him back to us. And behold, Nothing deserving death has been done by him. Therefore, I'll, punishment, I'll punish him and release him. Now, Pilate's idea is, look, you're going to be to me. It's going to, I'll punish him. We'll, we'll hit him a few times, cat of nine tails, and send him on his way. Now, he was obliged to release to them at the feast of the Passover one prisoner. That was one thing that Romans would do for the Jews at the Passover time. And they cried out, all together saying, away with this man and release for us Barabbas. <laughs> wow. He was one who had been thrown into prison for insurrection made in the city and for murder. The worst kind, the worst sort of person. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept calling out saying, crucify him, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, Why? What evil has this man done? I have found no guilt demanding death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. But they kept insistent with loud voices that he be crucified, and their voices began to prevail, and Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted. And he released the man that they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for the insurrection and murder. And he delivered Jesus to their will. Hmm. Wow. Mark says the same thing. Pilate knows this is injustice. He's the final justice. But politics being what they are, he eventually caves into their will. Jesus faced the injustice of the trials. He faced the injustice of the accusations he, of the whole system. It's an amazing thing. See, Jesus was not only innocent of the charges against him, Jesus Christ was innocent of any charge against him. Hmm. One writer says this, Jesus was God's model of a human being, ever honest in the midst of hypocrisy, relentlessly kind in a world of cruelty, heavenly focused in spite of countless distractions. When it came to sin... Jesus never did. Hebrews 4.15 says, He was tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. That's the greatest case of injustice ever on earth. And I am forever grateful for that. How about you? I am grateful for the injustice done to Jesus Christ. 
I am grateful that justice wasn't done to me or to you. Ephesians 2.1 said, I was dead in my trespasses and sin. John 3.16, I was going to perish forever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed him should not perish but have everlasting life. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. I was going to perish forever. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, I was blinded by the evil one to see the truth. In Ephesians 2, 12, I had no hope without God in the world. That's what justice would have given me. It's what justice would have given you. Even at our best, or my best, according to Isaiah 64, 6, it says, all my righteous deeds are like used menstrual cloths to God. I have no greatness before. I have no standing before God. The best I could ever be isn't nearly good enough. And I was dead in my trespasses and sin. Wow. Now let's look at that again, the same story back here and for in 23.13. I just want you to see this again. So Pilate talks to the chief priest and them, and he says, you brought me this man. I don't find anything regarding it. He said, in verse 16, I'll punish him and I'll release him. Now he was obligated to release them at the feast of one prisoner. And they cried out all together, saying, away with this man, release for us Barabbas. Now, if you've seen the movie, Barabbas is a very sympathetic character. I think it was Victor Mature that played him. But Barabbas is not that kind of man. He's an insurrectionist and a murderer, and it's likely he murdered a Roman as an insurrectionist. They want him crucified. And imagine being Barabbas. He's in about a 10 foot by 10 foot holding cell. He's in the Antonia Fortress in Jerusalem. And this is the day of his execution. I'm guessing he's thinking about what's about to happen to him. The cross. He's seen it many times. The agony, the mockery, and the almost unbelievable torturous death. He knows what he deserves. He knows he has this coming. He is a violent, hateful life taker. You see, you and I will never fully appreciate grace until we understand who we are. We are Barabbas. Do you understand that? We are Barabbas. We deserve to die. We have been incarcerated by our own sinful past. We sit on the floor of that dusty cell awaiting the certainty of our sin. We hear the executioner's steps coming down the hall of the cell. And we await his words. It's time to face your destiny. He speaks as the door opens. And he says, you're free to go. Just imagine what that must have felt like you're free to go. They took Jesus instead of you. <laughs> wow. The shackles are removed, and you find yourself outside in the morning sun. What happened? Grace happened. The grace of God 
happen to you and to me. The unmerited, undeserved, unearned kindness and favor of God. I don't know if we think about this enough. You see, it's not grace and, it's not grace with, it's not grace plus, it's not grace but, it's grace period. You see, this should have an enormous effect on us. Last week I started this series and I said that we started out with the words of Jesus Christ when he said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the gate of those who find life. Few find it. And that narrow gate, as I tried to say last week, is grace. And most of the world doesn't want grace. It's an interesting thing. They want to earn it. They want justice. And that's what you'll get in the broad gate. This all began in the Tower of Babel, I said last week, the first birth of religion. We will earn our way to have God's favor. It's an amazing thing when you think of it. Paul goes out of his way. We are saved by his grace. It's not of works. No one can boast about this. Salvation is a gift of God. All you can do with a gift is to receive it. God then at that moment declares you righteous. You, the sinner, declared righteous by a holy God. Hmm. That's grace. It's free for us. But this event right here that I'm reading about tells you how costly it was to Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, come believer and contemplate this sublime truth of God thus proclaimed to you in the simplest possible language. He laid down his life for us. There's not one long word in that sentence, he said. No one can say, I don't understand what that means. That's grace. What grace has accomplished, what it has conquered, the wasted years of life, the poor choices of life. One writer said, God answers the mess of life with one word, grace. Wow. You see, we talk as though we understand grace, and I'm pretty well convinced we don't. In fact, we use it in so many different ways. The bank will give you a period of grace. Wow. A seedy politician falls from grace. Musicians speak of a grace note. We describe an actress as gracious and a beautiful dancer as graceful, full of grace. We use the word for hospitals and baby girls and pre-meal prayers. We talk as though we know what grace means. I think we've settled for a wimpy grace. Grace comes after you. Grace shouts to you. And then grace rewires you. Grace calls us to change and then gives us the power to pull it off. That's what grace does. Grace takes us who are afraid to die. to an idea of ready to fly. It's not on our own. That's what the grace of God accomplishes in our lives. We should be overwhelmed by the grace of God. Never take it for granted. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3. The Apostle Paul gives us a perfect example. In the first couple of verses, Paul says, I make known to you, the brethren, the gospel 
which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. He said, let me explain what I said. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I received. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. The writer of Hebrews says he died once for all. He says in that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, that's his brother, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me also. The Damascus Road experience of Paul, an unbelievable experience. But notice what Paul says. For I am the least of the apostles, and am not fit to be called an apostle. I know who I am. He says, because I persecuted the church of God. You don't understand who I was. All of us are bad guys, but I'm worse than bad. I persecuted the, word, the church of God. Paul likely orchestrated the, the stoning of the first martyr of the church. Stephen is martyred, and Paul's right there, and He's insisting, kill this man. He deserves to die. And Jesus appeared to him. He said, but by notice, the grace of God, I am what I am. That's true for all of us. Everything eternally, intrinsically good about me is by the grace of God. And the same is true for you. Everything. I don't get credit. You see, there's no credit to get here. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. The wages of sin is death. I get all that. So Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. Now, I love this part. But I labored even more than all of them. Uh-oh. Paul catches himself. Wait, wait. Remember, he's a Pharisee. He's a doer. You see, he's zealous. I, and I really, he says, yet not I, but grace of, the grace of God with me. When I said I labored, I really didn't mean me. That's what he's saying. The reason I've labored is because of the grace of God, not because of me. But he, I just as though he caught himself right there from that point of view. Wow, he is just overwhelmed by this. Grace happened to Paul, and it happened to you. Do you wake up in the day and say to yourself, I am what I am by the grace of God? I don't know if we do that. But every single thing that's good and eternal about you is from his grace. All of it. You see, it's a wonderful thing to shout, Christ died for the sins of the world. But it's a lot better to whisper, Christ died for my sins. You see, you never want to forget that. You don't ever want to forget that truth. Christ died for my sins. <laughs> St. Augustine said, How great a God is he who gives God. What a wonderful way to put it. How great a God is he who gives God. Grace is everything Jesus. <laughs> Grace lives because he lives. Grace does because he does. Grace works because he works. And grace matters because he matters. To be saved by grace is to be saved by him. Not by an idea, not by a doctrine, not by a creed, not by a church membership, but by Jesus himself. 
Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, verse 27. To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Here's the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose... Also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the grace of God. Now please understand, it doesn't say Christ for you. And it, and it doesn't say Christ with me. Or Christ working beside me. It says Christ in me. One last passage, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Here Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. Sometimes I think at the truth in this verse, we only come up with about half of it. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean when I go back and look at it a little bit closer. I have been crucified with Christ, and here's the part we forget. And it's no longer I who live. Do you think about that? But Christ lives in me. You see, I don't think we ever think about that. It's no longer I who live. Paul tells the Corinthians, you and I are a new creature in Christ. In Christ. You see, that's such an important thing. This identity that we have with Jesus Christ is an overwhelming thing in our lives. It should be our preoccupation as we face every day. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, this life, I live by faith in the Son of God. And what he means by that is in what I just said. This is Christ in me. Remember the song we sang earlier in the service? We said, if you love, if you hate me, what? I'll love you. You see, if you hurt me, what do I do? I'll forgive you. How many times have you said, I, I can't do that? I can't. What does that have to do with anything? Let me ask you this. Can he forgive them? Well, he's the one that lives in you. You see, no, no, my man's still, my man's still going strong. And I, don't, I just can't do those kind of things. You see, that song, I'm going to go the Jesus way here, you see, is the logical outcome of the Christian life. And somehow, though, we just sort of let it go by. And I think what ends up happening to us so often is that we just don't, we don't really meditate on that truth at all. And we keep trying in, a, in our own way to fight through the Christian life in our own flesh. And then we're always disappointed. I still have anxiety. I'm still worried. I'm still feel fearful. I still have a terrible temper. I still... I thought you were a new creature. You see, how does this work? And God says, look, and I can accomplish this in your life because I'm going to give you all the grace you need. So Paul's thorn in the flesh must have made him miserable. I entreated the Lord three times, let this pass from me. I am in unfathomable pain, apparently. And finally God says, no. No. Why? He said, 
My grace is sufficient. There's nothing in your life that God's grace is not sufficient for. Nothing. Nothing. God's grace is sufficient for everything in our lives. It's God's grace. You see, that becomes such an important part for us. And I think somehow we have relegated grace to, in a sense, a more wimpy definition and just think, well, I'm saved by grace. That means he did the work and I just put my faith in him and that's that. Well, he did do the work. And that is salvation. But it's a whole lot more than that. This idea of Christ in you, the hope of glory, in one way or another, I didn't count these up, commentator did, Paul refers to that 216 times in his epistles. 216 times he refers to the idea that Christ in you, the hope of glory. And yet we almost miss it. It's almost like we don't even see it. Hmm. No religion in the world makes that claim. No other movement or religion in the world implies the presence of its founder in his followers. Muhammad does not indwell Muslims. Buddha does not indwell Buddhists. They may influence, instruct, and entice, but no one occupies except Jesus Christ. That's the greatness of the grace of God. How should we respond? I'm going to kind of give you an analogy that's not perfect, but it maybe will help you emotionally figure out how you should respond. You remember the story of the Chilean miners? I hope you do. You remember that story? Okay, they, they were 2,000 feet into the earth. They had no way to get out at all. 33 men. No way out. They ate two spoons of tuna every other day. For all those weeks, two spoons of tuna every other day. Hmm. They said that they prayed every single moment that they could remember with the same prayer, save us, save us, somebody save us. What are they aware of? They can't save themselves. Hmm. Wow. So on, up on the land, they de developed a 13-foot capsule. They had people from NASA there even helping them. And they first were able to make a communication hole from the surface to the miners. And then they made an evacuation path. So on October the 13th, 2010, they began to emerge from the mine. A great-grandfather, a 44-year-old man who was planting his wedding at that very moment when he went into the cave, a 19-year-old. They all had different stories, but they all had the same predicament. They all had to trust somebody else to save them. And I remember reading this past week, one of them made a comment. And he said, I speak for all of us. There's not a single day that goes by that we aren't thankful. They'll all die again. You see, they all will. And yet, because they were saved, they are thankful every day of their life. How about you and me? We're never going to die. We've been saved. You see, that should be the prevailing attitude in our lives, without a doubt. Jesus Christ and the grace of God has saved me. He took on injustice so that I could have grace. Had God given any of us justice, we would all be lost. And so I am forever grateful for the injustice done to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus Christ. 
And even though we see so much injustice in his trials and crucifixion, we realize that you were sovereign over all that and that he was going to go to the cross as the Lamb of God and pay for the sins of the world. The scripture says we are saved by your grace, your unmerited favor. Our salvation is a gift that can only be received. Thank you, Father, for this gift. Those of us who have been born again into your family have received the gift. We have not only the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, but we have a newness of life. We are new creatures in Christ. And our dependency on your grace to save us now becomes our dependency on your grace to help us live out our lives for your glory and for our good. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.